What a great way to start, Brian, orchestra. We appreciate that. And for those who may not be overly familiar with that song, the basic idea of the song is that the Holy Spirit would have free rule and reign in this room today, that we would be transformed as a result of being here today, and that is our prayer. Well, Psalm 100 says this, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. That's what we're going to do this morning. I'd like to invite you all to stand this morning as we're going to lift our voices, sing our praises to the King of kings, to the Lord of the world, the one who is worthy of all of our praise.
we'll sing it out. Oh, Lord, you're wonderful. Your touch is all I need. And when your hand is on this child, your healing I receive. And make this your prayer. We do pray this morning that uh, we would seek you first and foremost and always, that we can truly say that you are all that we seek in our life, in our loves, in our relationship with you, even in honoring you through our relationship with others. May you be the one that we long to love, to serve, to honor, to obey. For it's in Christ's name I pray these things. Amen. Won't you be seated? And uh, we are so glad that you're here this morning. And I've already told the choir, because uh, usually people ask me how it is driving in from Lynchburg. And let me tell you, it was an amazing drive today to uh, see the sun, the glory of God's creation as I was able to drive in today. And so glad that you're here as well. Uh, welcome. Uh, we'd love to see you and love to worship with you today. And uh, those who are joining us online through streaming, we're so glad that you're here with us as well. We pray that the service will be a blessing to you. and know it will be as we open up God's Word here in just a few minutes. And if you are new or if you've just not filled out one of our Blue Connect cards before, we'd love to know a little bit more about you. And they're in the back of the pew. And you can take them out and, and uh, fill it out uh, either in pen, pencil, whatever, or through the QR code just through your smartphone and uh, get us a little more information. And we can also know a little bit more about you and also how we might serve you better And uh, as we kind of travel uh, this worship path and this growing in Christ path together. Well, in just a second, we're going to stand again. You don't get a lot of time to sit, as you know, uh, during that time. But I do want to just remind us, uh, we're going to take a, a step back to another kind of older worship song this morning uh, that really has this same idea that we've already been singing, that Jesus would be the priority. He would be the one uh, that we would serve, that we would um, be able to proclaim together that nothing that we desire compares with him. And Paul says this in Philippians 3, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. May that be our declaration today. Let's stand together as we continue singing. Wonders of 
won't you be seated this morning? Well, amen. Nothing compares to the promise that I have in you. And all of God's people said to that, amen. You know, I don't know all the new songs we're going to learn in heaven. I know there's one new song the Bible promises we're going to learn. There's other songs we're going to learn that other believers know that we haven't learned. And then there's going to be some songs I believe that we get to sing that we knew here in this world. And I wouldn't be surprised at all, Dr. Paul, if that's not one of those songs. Uh, every time I, I sing that song, I hear it sung, it takes me back to markers in my own Christian life and worshiping with other friends who are now waiting for me in heaven. And it's a precious time. You know, that's what worship does. It marks times in our lives, and that's why if it's based in God's Word, even though the tune may be a little bit different from what's being played these days on the radio, it has special meaning to us. It's part of our worship language as uh, followers of Jesus Christ, as it were. Well, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad I'm here. Uh, I survived our children's camp uh, with Miss Mary down at Altamont, close to Shawsville on Friday night. It was a little chilly. We had about uh, close to 100 folks uh, that were out there. I'm so thankful for the uh, great work that Ann Edwards and her husband Evans and their son Carl provided along with Stacy and Sean and Price. And then, of course, uh, Randy and Anna Grubb jumped in there. And we have Grubb's Grub, you know, for uh, supper and for breakfast uh, during that day, uh, that time together. And then a hike to the waterfall uh, late yesterday morning, mid-morning. It was a wonderful, wonderful time. And more importantly, we had people who were guests. And those who are part of our CDC, our Early Childhood Development Center, uh, were joining us. Uh, ladies, single moms from Moms Meet. It was just a beautiful time together. So on the heels of that, and, and literally I had forgotten earlier in the week that I would be, I had obligated myself to bring the devotions and, and be out there, which I was glad to do of camping, uh, God directed me a week ago to this particular passage and this particular message. And, and so the title of the message is Let's Reach Kids. Is that a great title, following a kid's camp out, you know, just a few days, days ago. Now, the text is in Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 through 15. I invite you to turn in your Bibles there. Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 and 15. Now, this very passage that we're going to read, um, Mark talks about it in chapter 10, and Luke talks about it also in chapter 18. So this is a account, an experience that is repeated three times among the three of the four gospel writers. Let's look at these verses together. Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked the people. Now, I'm not going to ask how many of you sometimes have been impatient with a small child, but they obviously were this time, weren't they? The Bible says, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's important. And he laid his hands on them and went away. In Mark's account of this, uh, this event, uh, he, he hugged them, he put his arms around them, and, uh, and blessed them. May God bless the preaching and teaching of his living word to our hearts today. I want to begin on, you, you know, you can't preach on kids and reaching kids without listening to some of the wisdom 
that as adults, kids have for us. A small child shall lead them. So what, what are some of those wise words from children? Well, here, here's a few that you might uh, be blessed by. Patrick, age 10, he said, never trust a dog to watch your food. Okay? Hannah, age 9, said, when your dad is mad and asks you, do I look stupid, do not answer him. All right? Talia, age 11, said, when your mom is mad at your dad, never let her brush your hair. Okay? Andrew, age 9, said, a puppy always has bad breath, even when you give him a tic-tac. All right? Lauren, age 9, <laughs> felt tip markers are not good to use as lipstick. <laughs> especially if it's a Sharpie. Um, Alicia, ver, uh, age 13, when you get a bad grade in school, show it to your mom when she's on the phone, all right? And then Joel, age 10, don't pick on your little sister when she's holding your baseball bat, all right? Practical experience. And then finally, uh, Ellen, age eight, said, never, ever try to baptize your cat. So uh, those are wise words that we can take to the bank, can't we? You know, of all the ministries we have at First Roanoke, and we have so many wonderful ministries here, none are more important. Few rise to the priority uh, of our children's ministry that we call First Kids around here. Now, now how important is our church's children's ministry. Well, let's do a little experiment. How about a survey impromptu? If you became a Christian before the age of 12, as I did, would you raise your hand and hold it up for a minute? Look at that, all over the room, about a third or maybe even half of the congregation, we came to know Christ before the age of 12. Did you know that it becomes exponentially uh, greater that you will not be saved the older you get in America, in the American culture? Uh, in, in fact, uh, a person who is uh, age 50, I read some time back, that is, that is like a 50 to 60,000 chance to one that that person will ever be saved here in America. So it is important for us to reach kids with the gospel. Now, what about the background of our text? What's happening here in the story? Well, just before Jesus has this encounter with the uh, parents and their children, you have taking place uh, conflict, uh, confrontation uh, with some of the religious leaders. Now, Jesus has been up in Upper Galilee teaching and ministering. He's making his way back down to Jerusalem, and he's confronted by the religious rulers. Uh, trying to trip him up. They have already decided that this young rabbi from Galilee uh, who came from Nazareth is a threat, and he needs to be silenced. He needs to be discredited. Eventually, they would make the decision he needs to be killed. And then after this uh, encounter with the children, what happens next? Well, he has that uh, memorable conversation with the rich young ruler, that bright young man who had so much going for him but was so confident and proud in his own good works that he went to Jesus wanting to be complimented. What must a man do to uh, enter, to, to have eternal life as if heaven is something that we earn, something that we deserve, something that we merit? Jesus recognizing that ahead of God in this young man's heart was his money, his wealth. And so Jesus said, okay, go ahead and sell all the things that you have, give to the poor and follow me. And the Bible says he didn't walk away angry, he walked away sad. He walked away sad. He was disappointed because he had not been complimented. He was disappointed because Jesus touched on something in his heart that he knew was not in keeping with the Lord's uh, will in his life and God being first, perhaps even walked away sad as the doubt began to go through his thoughts. I wonder if I will die lost. I fear that I am right now lost. There might be somebody in this room. You might, you might have the same thought. You might not have peace that when you take your last 
breath, the next one will be in heaven. The Bible says for the Christian, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Dear friend, if that is you, uh, praise God. If that is not you, you're in the right place. Because today can be a day unlike any other day that will change every day that you face from this point forward as you invite Jesus Christ into your heart. Now we see in this passage, as well as in Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel, that God has a special place for boys and girls. He, he considers them special. And because God considers them special, so should we consider boys and girls to be special, a special opportunity for ministry. You want to reach the world? Reach a kid. You want to reach the future? Reach a child. How can we do it? How should we do it? Why must we do it? Well, these are some of the things we're going to be looking at in God's Word together in the next few minutes today. We're going to begin with point one, the desire of the parents. The desire of the parents. The kids didn't come on their own. They didn't hop in a chariot, jump on a camel, ride a donkey, and just say, hey, I'll be back in a little bit. I want Jesus to pray for me. No, they were brought by their parents. This is such an important principle, and it needs to be a practice again today, whereas in the majority of parents in America, um, they don't recognize that it's a good thing to bring their children to Jesus. Now, in Jewish culture, it was a common practice that, that uh, devout religious parents would bring their small child to the uh, rabbi uh, to be uh, prayed on, prayed for, and to lay their hands on and bless that child, especially on the evening of the Day of Atonement each year. And so it should not be surprising that, that a popular young rabbi like Jesus, who had so many people following him, that there would be parents wanting to bring their children to Jesus. Now, parents, we should naturally want to do what's best for our children. I think it's something that God just puts uh, in our hearts, uh, in our minds, that we want what is best for our sons and our daughters, our grandchildren. And let me just pause right now and say I'm so thankful for the parents and grandparents of this church. You know, we even had some grandparents that came to the camp out to make sure their grandchild was a part of the camp out this past Friday night. Now, how cold did it get at your house Friday night? Try being in a tent back up in the mountains in a holler in Shawsville. I guarantee you it was probably colder where we were than where you were. And yet they came and brought their children because they knew this was going to be important. Just like when we bring them on Sunday morning to uh, connect groups to Sunday school, uh, or when we bring them on Wednesday nights to uh, children's choir. What a wonderful thing to learn for a child, to learn the Bible by learning to sing songs about the Bible in singing songs in worship to the God of the Bible. It's his word anyway. Or what about Awana? Memorizing Bible verses. How incredibly important and valuable that is for them. Uh, you know, it is important that as a church family that we not uh, become tired of the work of children's ministry. Uh, now, understand something. My mom, bless her heart, you know, she dug her heels in. I tried my best to convince her that I don't need to go to children's choir because it's going to interfere with my future NFL Hall of Fame football career. But she dug her heels in, and she would not be moved. Didn't matter if I got mad. Didn't matter if, if I cried. It didn't matter if I complained. In fact, there was a uh, young mom, and she was there. Her, her uh, dad was not able to be there, so she came. Boy, you talk about a, a brave mom bringing her, her kids to camp out on her own. Moms, how many of you would have taken your kids camping uh, without dad being there? And anyway, uh, her little girl began to become a little bit unhappy. She wanted to do something that wasn't good. She thought playing close to the fire would be cool. You know, the camp out, uh, the, bond, the campfire. And so mama said, we're not going to do that. And so little girl kept pushing, and, and she held her by the hand, and the little girl wanted to continue on, and she said, now, now are we going to need to cry about this first? And what was she saying? If you're going to cry, go ahead and get it over with. I, I'm not going to change my mind. Go ahead and get it done, and then we'll just move on. You know, too many parents are afraid to let their kids cry. 
Too many parents are afraid, I'm, I'm, I, I fear, to uh, have their kids mad at them. You know, one of the things that my parents never did ask me, do you want to go to church today? <laughs> that never was a question that was asked in my childhood. You know, do you want to go to vacation Bible school? Never asked at my house. You know, do you want to go to youth camp? Never mad. Our youth choir never asked. And yet these days it seems that society has been more effective in instructing Christian parents how to not parent their kids than as a church has been in instructing Christian parents how they should parent their kids. Understand something. Parenting is not for cowards. You figure that out. It's like old age. It's part of life. And if God blesses you with a child or a grandchild, Here's our confidence. God will give you what you need to do what God wants you to do. So hang in there, mom and dad. Don't give up the fight, grandparents. The Bible says that my God is able to supply all of your needs according to the riches and glory of Christ Jesus our Lord. That means physical strength. That means patience. That means love. That means discernment. That means whatever it is that you need and what that means when it comes to helping to bring up your children to know and trust in Jesus Christ to know God's will is revealed to us in his living word, and to practice it. And, and so we start with the desire of the parents. What a good thing to take their kids to Jesus. How sad it is when taking a child to Jesus is far down on the list. Sports, practice, travel ball, art, peers, Friends and all kinds of other things becomes priority other than taking your child to Jesus. I want to tell you something, my friend. In any way, in every way that you can introduce your son, your daughter, your grandson, your granddaughter to Jesus Christ, you as a Christian are obligated to do it. It's not just a duty, it is a delight, it is an opportunity. And it is something that has reward that goes far beyond this present life. Well, let's read on and look at our text. Point number two, the mistake of the disciples. The mistake of the disciples. Now, Matthew, when he's talking about this particular incident, is not talking about that Jesus was busy with other people and then you had just kind of the pig and the python episode. All of a sudden there was a big rush of, of boys and girls and parents coming to Jesus, like a bubble that just showed up. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about, what he's describing, is what was taking place all day long, throughout the day. And finally, it might have been Simon Peter, you know, he was a little bit impetuous. Finally, he said, enough is enough. Tell these parents to quit bringing their kids to Jesus. He doesn't have time for them, or he's too busy for them. We've got other things to do. We're running behind schedule, somebody may have said. The disciples made the mistake of not recognizing how important it was to Jesus to welcome boys and girls to himself whose parents had brought them that day. Here's what they did, the disciples, that is. They minimized what Jesus maximized. Now, friend, have you made that mistake this past week? I have. Minimizing what Jesus wants us and is busy maximizing. We want to be careful that we don't make the same mistake. What about church? One of the things that you folks are going to enjoy is how often we end up having family dedication services. Now, occasionally it will be at the 9 o'clock hour, but most of these happen in the next hour. And when we come together, it's going to be a great thing because you're going to see more people being baptized, more people coming to the altar, more people dedicating their children to Christ. You're going to say, man, this is wonderful. But you know if you've ever been in one of our family, which is really more of a family dedication service than a baby dedication service, I always ask the question, church family, are you willing to make a commitment today that you will do whatever it takes to provide the ministry that this child and his family or hers needs and support here in this church. That means giving, that means serving, that means praying, that means whatever it takes. And everybody usually gives a great hearty Baptist, amen. 
And then we can't find workers on Wednesday night to simply sit still and listen to kids read Bible verses they've memorized. 15, 20 minutes. We can't find people taking turns to help in First Kids Church. And sometimes Ann and Evan Edwards are the only workers on Sunday morning there. We can't find the helpers that we need to come in and work for a few days in vacation Bible school, to hold a door, to usher a child from one room to another, to help make snacks, to clean up when things are over, to set up before things begin. Friend, kids' ministry is hard. you got to roll up your sleeves. It's like parenting your own child. You don't put it on automatic pilot and just let it sail away. It's important. And I hope that one of the things that this message will do, not that anyone is placed under a guilt trip, but maybe a stinging conscience of conviction by the Holy Spirit will inspire some of us to be more involved this year in children's ministry than we have been in months now past. You say, well, I've already done my time. My kids are grown. Well, where's your rocking chair in the church? When did God tell you it's okay to retire? What about getting involved someplace, somewhere? Let's reach kids. You see, when moms are more focused, let's take this at home. What about parents? It, it starts at the family. Uh, what are we doing as parents? If those of you who are parents and have small children in the home, and most will be in the next service, you know, do we do um, moms? Are we more focused on fashion than faith? Dads, are we more focused on sports than Scripture? Uh, again, it's not about a guilt trip, but we shouldn't let things that we like compete with things that we know are best. A lot of us have water filters at home, either water filters in pitchers like Mary and I have, or some of you have water filters under the sink, and uh, you do that for what reason? To keep impurities out of the water that you drink and cook with. Well, parents, guess what? One of the things that God wants us to do is to do the best we can, we're not perfect, but make the effort to keep the impurities away from the hearts of our kids. And that's becoming harder and harder. If you have a small child, let me ask you a question. Is it really important for that kid to have a smartphone? Hmm? A Facebook account? An Instagram account? TikTok? What difference does it make that all of their friends and parents are saying yes? Does that mean you are obligated to say yes too? Do you even understand the threat that social media poses today? for small minds that are developing and growing. How many of you used to have a flip phone? Raise your hand. If you ever had a flip phone, I mean, some of you didn't have a flip phone. There we go. There we go. All of us had a flip phone, didn't we? If we're old enough. Now, how many of you died because you had a flip phone? How many of you were in a wheelchair day because you had a flip phone? How many of you had your right arm drop off because you, didn't, because you had a flip phone? See how silly that is. See how silly that is. The world is doing its best to get its claws in the hearts and minds of children. It's up to Christian parents, grandparents, families, and even Christians who are not parents yet to be together, united in Jesus, to reach kids, to challenge and encourage each other to fight the good fight of faith. It is never more worth it than when you're doing it for a small child. Well, what about number three? The rebuke of the Savior. Now, this is so interesting. In one of the gospel writers' account of what's happening here, the disciples, uh, I believe Mark, uses a very strong word to describe what the disciples did. I mean, they weren't being bashful about it. They weren't saying, you know, I, I don't want to offend you, but would it be okay if you just came back later? You know, Jesus has had a busy day. He's got a lot more appointments. No. The, it's a strong word that Mark uses. He is saying, stop. The disciples are just being bold and brash and, and uh, authoritative. They're Barney Fife on steroids. That's what they are. Some of you who like Andy Griffith, you know what I'm talking about. 
And so what Matthew describes is Jesus' response. And the Bible says that Jesus was indignant in some of your translations. Now, isn't it something how bold and blunt the Lord Jesus could be sometimes? You know, he didn't say, you know, I don't want to hurt the feelings of my disciples. And, and so I'll just call Peter over and say, hey, man, why don't you just chill and cool on this idea of, of trying to, to uh, get the parents not to bring the kids. It's okay. You know, I don't want to hurt your feelings. No. He didn't care about how they felt. He cared about the fact that they were getting in his way in the work that his father had called him to do. As they were being public, rebuking parents, he was public and rebuking them. In fact, Jesus is stronger in his rebuke of the disciples than the disciples were in their rebuke of the parents. Now, how many of you would think, you know, that's uncouth, Jesus, that's uncool. Why, you just don't talk to people like that. Understand something, Jesus can talk to people any way he wants to, Amen. And he will at the great white throne judgment. He will at the Bema seat judgment because he will be judged then as he is judged now. But now you can know him as Savior if you receive him as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. And so that's the situation that's taking place. Jesus rebukes them. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, Jesus said and gives a strong warning. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Wow. You want to take on an angel? They mistreat a child. Jesus didn't ignore what they were doing. He made it very clear that what they were doing was wrong. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a wonderful British pastor yesteryear, Bible scholar and preacher, he writes this, Youth are susceptible to evil doctrine. Whether we teach young Christians truth or not, the devil will be sure to teach them error. They will hear it somehow, even if they are watched by the most careful guardians. The only way to keep chaff out of a child's little measure is to fill it to the brim with good wheat. Oh, may the Spirit of God help us to do this. The more the young are taught, the better truth will keep them from being misled. In other words, you want to bless a child, then teach them the Bible. Refer to them the Bible. When your teenager wants to do something that's out of bounds, you don't have to just say no because I said so. Ask them, what does the Bible say about it? And then if you don't know, then you need to sneak off and look it up yourself. Help them to understand that being a Christian means there are things we do and things we don't do. There are things that we're committed to, things that we're responsible for. This is what God says. Now, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 6, Jesus goes on to say, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe it be to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in, in the depths of the sea. Now, what is that about? Did you know one of the ways of executing a person in Jesus' day was to do just that? You put their hands behind their back, you tie a millstone around the neck, you throw them off the boat, throw them off the cliff into the water, and you drown them. And Jesus said, God takes this so seriously, it would be better that you drown yourself than to cause these little ones to stumble. Now, here's a great question for all of us as Christians who have influence with children, whether we're parents or not. How important is my faith in the eyes of children? You can put your child's name in there, regardless of how old they are. In fact, the older they are, the more able they are to see how important your faith is. Or, here's a better question maybe for some of us, does my child even know that my faith is important to me? Do you ever talk about that? About something God shows you in your prayer time, in your devotion time? Write them a note and say, God reminded me of you when I was reading this verse today, and, and I just want you to know I love you and I'm praying for you today. Jesus is not teaching us that we should make children the center of the universe. That, that's not what this is about. If you grew up with brothers and sisters back in the day, one of the things you never heard your mom say at supper time was, what do you all want to eat? <laughs> she just made it. And if you didn't get it yourself and say, well, I don't like that, then you had a brother that probably said, good, I'll take it. 
and snooze, you lose. Uh, children should not be made the center of the universe, but they should be made to be special in our eyes as God makes them and sees them special in His eyes. And one of the things that we must understand and not forget, children are children. And simply because they have a free will and a desire to do or be something doesn't necessarily mean that they are qualified to be that or to do that. I wanted to be Superman, but I discovered by simply tying a little blanket around my neck and jumping off of the upper part of my bunk bed does not make me Superman. I, I wanted to be a, a professional NFL uh, ball player. That didn't work out either. Then I thought, hey, the Lone Ranger, that sounds pretty good. Mom and Dad, I need a horse. I'm going to be the next Lone Ranger. Well, you can see that didn't work out either. In fact, the only thing I said was, God, I just don't want to be a Baptist preacher. <laughs> Sometimes God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? Now, friend, I want to remind you of something. This is important. We are living in a time and a day and age where um, for the name of political correctness or what should be acceptable, we are doing things or allowing things that are completely unacceptable. A child has obvious limitations. Uh, they are to be dependent on a parent to train them, to teach them, and to protect them. And not just parents, but school teachers as well and anybody else who works with kids. There's a responsibility to protect them. And yet we live in a day and time when this attitude of free to be a bird or bee is so prevalent that children can imagine to do something or be something and, and adults are expected to just affirm it, that it's somehow harmful to tell that child, no, you can't do that. You shouldn't be that. That's not what God wants. Uh, dear friends, let us be very clear when it comes to teaching our children. There are only two kinds of people, men and women. Only two kinds of people. And the, uh, you cannot change the DNA of God's design for a man or for a woman, a boy or for a girl. Uh, only women can have babies, by the way. That shouldn't be a newsflash, but it is for some people. In the words of a high school student, Megan Simpkins, this past week, who I believe she said it very well, why are we, speaking of our society, affirming the mental confusion of boys and girls, of boys and men, rather, by allowing mentally confused men to use women's spaces? Whatever you do, simply because you call it art or you feel like it doesn't make it right, nor does it mean that others should just allow you and encourage you and celebrate you and affirm you to do it. Now, someone said the question isn't um, um, uh, why uh, not let drag queens read books to children. The question is why do they want to? It's important in times like these that we not waver and become afraid to stand on that which God has clearly said that he made them male and female. That God is right. Let the rest of the world and all others be proven to be liars, but God is true. Is God the author of confusion? That's not, uh, that should be an easy question. The answer is no. Uh, is, is the devil the father of lies and deceit? The answer is yes. That's why as Christians, whether you're a parent or an educator, and I grew up in the home of two educators, college and elementary school, both public college and elementary school, that we need to base our instructions, our moral perspective, how we practice, what we say, based on the truth of God's Word and not be afraid of being criticized. How in the world can we expect any reward for our faith in, as Christians if we're afraid more so of offending the world rather than offending a holy and righteous God? In addition to not hindering children, we need a guard against not helping them. 
It's not just a matter of not doing the wrong thing. It's the importance of doing the right thing. It's okay if you have to tell your child, we're not going to do that because we're a Christian family. And when you grow up and go on your way, then you can choose to do that if you want to. But that doesn't happen here. We're going to go to church. We're not going to do this or we're going to do that because that's what it means. I'm not talking about legalism. I'm talking about the the motivation of a gracious heart that is thankful for the amazing grace by which God has saved us. This is important. And we come to the last part of our study this morning, the blessing of the children. Uh, Jesus, uh, in Mark's gospel, he says he takes them in their arms he, sh- he brings them close to him. Here's what we need to remember and not forget. God is love. What was it that we learned in Sunday school? Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. That's true. And because Jesus does, we should. Because Jesus said, suffer the children to come to me. Don't hinder them. Don't keep them away. We should welcome them. And do all that we can to welcome more and more. We should be patient with them, prayerful for them. How can you bless your child? By showing them what it means to live a life that is truly devoted to Jesus Christ. By demonstrating for them in your actions and your words what it means to be a Christ follower. To uh, spend time in God's Word so that when you have those questions, when you have those uh, conversations, when you have those opportunities, you're not just spouting out what you feel, but you are sharing what God has shown you by the Holy Spirit that is true in His words. Remember, Christianity is not just a matter of being taught. It's a matter of being caught, and that's especially true when we're around children. Well, what if my children are all ready off the reservation? I don't mean simply out of the house. What if they no longer go to church? What if they no longer seem to, to hold to that which I had taught them or sought to? Well, first of all, you don't give up hope. The Bible says our faith in God is mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. You don't give up in the faith in what God is able to do more in a moment than you can do in a lifetime. That God's grace is greater than your mess-ups and your failures. And by the way, there's no such thing as a perfect parent. Just like there's no such thing as a perfect kid. That means we stand on God's Word and we are not moved. That means we continue to intercede. We go to war on their behalf, spiritually speaking. When it comes to intercessory prayer, we continue to show them that we love them. We don't cut them off and say, when you get right with God, then you can come back and be right with me. No! Is that how the the prodigal son's father treated him? Man, he was on the front porch expecting, waiting, and longing, and praying that his boy would come back. And he ran to him. Only picture in the Bible where God is running, and he's running to that prodigal son. You see, these are wonderful things that we can anchor in and hold on to and should when it comes to praying for, loving, training, teaching our children. Even when they're grown, there should be no doubt that your faith in Jesus Christ is the most important, precious, valuable thing that you have going for you, that you consider that to be more important than anything else in your life, and that you demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit in your conversations with them and loving them and accepting them. That doesn't mean you like what they do nor respect their choices, but it does mean You never forget that your mom and your dad are your grandparents. Notice what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Mom and dad, don't give up. What is hope? Hope is not giving up. Hope is holding on without wavering. And when we start to waver, we run to God, we hit our knees, we seek the Lord, we fall before His throne of grace, we stand on His Word, and we ask the Holy Spirit to comfort and help us because that's His role. For He who promised is, say it together, church, faithful. Who loves your kid more than you? Who loves your grandkid more than you? God does, and He's faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, including our kids, and especially when they're small still at home. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, 
Don't give up going to church. It's hard for you to say Jesus is important when you'd rather be golfing, fishing, hunting, or anything else. As is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What's that? That means Jesus is coming back. That means Jesus is coming soon. It's important for us, as James Dobson said, as parents and grandparents, not to become overcommitted with things that take us away from the most important things in life, like being, having conversations at home as a family, family devotions, going for walks or dates with mom, doing fun things with the kids, being involved in their life and then being involved in yours. And yet too many times... We're too overcommitted and we're too exhausted to do the things that we ought to do. Uh, let me just say this. In closing, if you do not presently fast and pray, and that may be just one meal, maybe just one hour, if God is leading you to do that, be open to that. Because never before has parenting, I believe in grandparenting, been more of a spiritual warfare than it is today. It's always been, but right now in America, it especially is so. When you look at academia, you look at media, you look at peer pressure, and then you look at bad habits that maybe so many Christian families inadvertently, not meaning to, but have embraced, it's spiritual warfare. Now, why would you engage in spiritual warfare and not look to the one whom we like to sing about, there's victory in him? Look at this last verse. Mark 10, verse 15, I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. What is he saying? I want to talk to the adults in the room. Jesus is saying this, Children's, children trust, don't they? Uh, children are able to focus and believe. Uh, children will accept one's word as truth when they're little. Jesus is saying, unless you humble yourself like a little child, you won't even see heaven. You won't be saved. You can't become a Christian. That was one of the problems with the Pharisees, the scribes, and the religious rulers. They were so proud of themselves. Your church membership and all the good things you've done in the community does not merit you one second of heaven's air. It's all by grace. And so have you ever become as a little child where you admitted, God, I cannot save myself. I do not deserve heaven, but I believe that you love me. Jesus, I believe you died for me on the cross, and I believe you rose again from the dead. I believe you are God, the very Son of God, the living God, the triune God, and I believe that you will forgive me of all of my sins, casting them as far as from me and you as east is from the west, never to remember them anymore. Will you do that if I trust you and ask you to come into my heart? Lord, I'm doing that right now. Is there anyone here that wants to do that this morning? You may not have planned on it, but hey, you're in the right place to make a life-changing decision. And you will find it easier to respond to others with love and forgiveness and kindness and patience, whether they're in your family or not, once you become a follower of Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean you'll be perfect, doesn't mean you'll be sinless, but you will sin less because now you have a relationship with your Creator. And the doubts and the questions that either are a big deal now, God will either answer or he will give you the peace to trust him with the answer when he's ready to let you know about it. What about it today? Is there anyone who wants to become a Christian? Anyone who says, I'm ready to be like a little child to humble myself and be saved? Now is the time. This is the place. Would you stand with me, please, as we pray? I've asked that a very familiar song be our hymn of invitation this morning. We will not keep it long, but we will keep it clear. And that is, if you want to become a Christian, come. If you want to be baptized in water by immersion following your salvation experience, come. If you want to join the church and you're already a baptized follower of Jesus, then come. Or if you want someone to pray with you, come. Right now, as the song is sung, you come. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They Jesus. Uh -huh.
that with Paul right now. Let's sing it with him. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Father, we thank you for the way that you love us perfectly, clearly, unconditionally, patiently, gently. God, we pray that we as followers of yours and as your church, when it comes to reaching kids, loving boys and girls and their parents, that, Father, we would reflect that same love toward them, even as we have been blessed to receive it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once you to be seated, we've got a special treat for you today. We're going to go a little bit longer, but it's summertime. We're going to hear from our children's choir this morning. And uh, would you give them a round of applause as we are blessed to see them again? <laughs> Tell you who we also need to be applauding is Michelle and all of those wonderful ladies that help us with children's choir. Will you say thank you to our children's workers this morning? Amen. And if you didn't clap, we just signed you up. We're taking pictures of the room, okay? So you'll be, you'll be enlisted. Seriously, about being enlisted, uh, at the, when we're dismissed uh, a few moments from now, uh, and Michael will remind us too, over in the crossing at the Connecting Center, just out these doors, uh, we are needing and we have opportunities for you to sign up and help us in Vacation Bible School. Did you know that the more workers we have, the more kids we have? It's just one of the things that God does for children's ministry here. So if you can only serve a day or all five days, if you can serve a few hours or the entire full day, I hope you'll stop and register with some of our workers for VBS. Let them know that you're going to help us reach kids this year. Now let's enjoy their music. 